Good morning and welcome on this Palm Sunday morning, the 28th of March. Our Holy Week this year, the beginning of Holy Week for Christians, also equates with the Jewish festival of Passover. So we remember our friends of the Jewish faith as they celebrate their festival, as do we. Passover, one of the great pilgrim festivals before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and that meant journeying. Three of the festivals through the year meant journeying for Jesus and his family and certainly Palm Sunday shows Jesus journeying on a very special journey. So we're going to journey this morning and one of the feasts of the journeying year for the Jewish people, which Jesus would have kept, would have been the Feast of Tabernacles, the Bible tends to call it. It's uh, Sukkot, and that's not this time of year, it's a harvest type of feast. When people lived in booths and shelters, we'll think about that more in our reflection, but we have something special also in an artwork to share with you this morning, which speaks of the way in which humanity builds shelters for itself in its human journey. Sometimes they last a very long time, but all are temporary, and Jesus makes that very clear in his teaching, especially in the fourth gospel. When those, those booths, those shelters are made today, and they're made in cities and places where those of the Jewish faith are living, those temporary shelters are woven through with the branches of four types of trees, willow, and myrtle, and palm, and citrus. And so we're going to journey ourselves around the garden, beginning here with willow behind. And it's standing our best willow, a weeping willow, and is beginning now to leaf and show that here in the northern hemisphere, spring is arriving and the paschal full moon is almost in place so that Easter can be celebrated and today Passover itself. So we, we think of all those things and we also think of our human journey through life and our Christian journey through Holy Week. All those themes interweaving like the leaves of those four particular trees weaving in and out of the temporary shelter made for Sukkos. So we come back to that as we journey in the garden, but as with yesterday, I'm going to say sections of our morning prayer as we go around. And the first section is here by the willow. Bring your prayers and your intentions right across the uh, miles of the, of the globe and uh, think of the beginning now of Holy Week. We have birds around us singing and the peregrine falcon is flying above us, one of the fastest birds in creation. And so that's a, a, a wonderful thing to hear. You may, you may hear the peregrine screech. And behind, of course, you see the um, girls whom we were with yesterday, and um, they are waiting to go on their walk. But we're, we're going to say our prayers first this morning and not take them with us. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving power among the nations. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only Son was lifted up, that he might draw the whole world to himself. May we walk this day in the way of the cross, and always be ready to share its weight, declaring your love for all the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 132. Lord, 
Remember for David all the hardships he endured, how he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come within the shelter of my house, nor climb up into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep, nor let my eyelids slumber, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. Now we heard of the ark in Ephrathah, and found it in the fields of Jair. Let us enter his dwelling place and fall low before his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and your faithful ones sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, turn not away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn an oath to David, a promise from which he will not shrink. Of the fruit of your body shall I set upon your throne. If your children keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their children also shall sit upon your throne for evermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion for himself. He has desired her for his habitation. This shall be my resting place forever. Here will I dwell, for I have longed for her. I will abundantly bless her provision. Her poor will I satisfy with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her faithful ones shall rejoice and sing. There will I make a horn to spring up for David. I will keep a lantern burning for my anointed. As for his enemies, I will clothe them with shame, but on him shall his crown be bright. Our journey begins at the willow, but we leave the willow now for the myrtle. So I found myself a natural shelter to read our lesson in, um, and I'm sitting underneath the tall myrtle tree, which is on this side. You can see it rising high there, the second of the trees that we spoke of. I'm sitting on a little stone seat set in the flint wall here by Lady Baggett, the wife of one of my predecessors in the early 19th century. And we have the loveliest print painted by her niece uh, of Lady Baggett with her daughters and their dog having a picnic just, <clears throat> just here on the grass. So we think of all that and meals outside and the pilgrim feast must have been like that for Jesus and his family as they traveled from Galilee to the temple in Jerusalem. Three times a year those three those pilgrim feasts uh, happened and we find that particularly in the Gospel of St John when Jesus' brothers are saying shall we go up to the feast shall we and they're talking about one or other of the feasts and as I said today is the feast of Passover but also uh, it's uh, a time when we think of the other two pilgrim feasts the one that we would call Pentecost, often called the Feast of Weeks, and the autumn one, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, and that's the one we shall think of in our reflection as well. But for the moment I'm reading the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and the lectionary sets that for us this year in St Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. As I said yesterday, through Holy Week we shall be seeing a, a pattern of the four Gospels complementing each other and our reflections will be on our human journey, our mental journey, our spiritual journey as we walk the way of the cross, conscious of our place within the family of humanity at this time in our history with so much separation because of the pandemic. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. 
and they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it and some of those standing there said to them what are you doing untying the colt and they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go and they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that day they had cut from the fields and those who went before and those who followed were shouting Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David Hosanna in the highest and Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late he went out to Bethany with the twelve it's fairly clear that it's Bethany from where the coat has come and it was Bethany that Jesus and his disciples had been in before all this happened and before they went away to prepare themselves or Jesus to prepare himself for this entry into Jerusalem. Jesus doesn't want to be waylaid in the village of Bethany. He has an entry into Jerusalem to make for himself on his own physical, mental and spiritual journey as our anointed one, as the anointed son of David who will enter the holy city and enter the holy place and so the cult and notice St Mark the earliest of the Gospels telling us no one has ever sat on this cult before now normally that means real difficulty somebody's sitting on an untried donkey or horse but here all seems to be well as the Lord sits on the cult covered with uh, the cloaks of those around uh, and uh, begins to ride on the entry into Jerusalem. We're going to journey on ourselves now and we have journeyed from Willow to Myrtle and then on now to Palm. So here on our third pause on this journey on Palm Sunday morning <coughs> we've come to a palm, the Trachycarpus tree, which we planted about 18 years ago or so. It shows what a temperate place this is of the herbaceous border, but your eye will first be taken by the great Euland Denodata magnolia behind me here in full bloom as we've seen on other mornings and again we've gratitude to Wendy White Thompson and her husband Ian for planting this and Wendy is very ill at the moment and so we're praying for her daily and also praying for her family this morning. This kind of uh, mellow atmosphere which the herbaceous border has shows that we can grow bananas here. The bananas are not even thinking of showing their leaves yet but it does cause me to say something about what we would normally be doing on Palm Sunday morning and for two years now we've not been able to and that's having a procession of people bearing palm crosses or fronds of palm and the long fronds which the clergy carry but notice that in St Mark's Gospel it simply says that the, the crowds took branches from the trees where they were simply to wave in festal throng in their, in their procession along and the tradition here in a land where palms don't grow was to use simply branches from the trees and I found that right across the world that on this day people take branches from the trees to shout Hosanna, hooray, the Lord is coming to the holy city riding upon the humble beast uh, which has been just lent for the day and will be taken back to Bethany that evening. I've got fronds which I've seen carried, here's actually a, a banana frond which uh, one has seen carried in lands where bananas grow but generally palms are around there too so they can carry palm leaves here's a palm leaf and there are certainly palm leaves growing here but above me on the trachycarpus 
There's a bamboo here, which would be something that could be, be carried, a, a stem of bamboo, and even a, a stem of wattle or mimosa, as we call it, because that would be something that people could carry. But the English palm, which was carried in processions and waved, was always the goat willow, the pussy willow. And uh, I've got fronds of that. I've been in processions where those were carried. But perhaps I could say to you that many of you will not be able to go to church today and go into a procession of palms. So when you're out in your garden or on your walk today, just pick a sprig of something and know that that's faithful to the Gospel of St. Mark, which doesn't mention palms, it simply mentions taking branches from the trees to shout Hosanna as the Anointed One enters the Holy City in great humility and within him he knows what this will bring in terms of the violence showed towards his humanity. For the moment it's all Hosanna and the crowds are cheering him and those who've gathered for the feast of the, the Passover and all that pilgrimaging along the way, which Jesus would have done with his parents and enjoyed all the festivities, all those who are gathering from across the world as it then was, coming back to the Feast of Passover. And we know later some, some Greeks are there who want to see Jesus. But for the moment, all of them are saying, who's this? Who's this? And the answers are being given at the moment by friends. But Jesus is coming right into the place where, as a little boy, he called his father's house, the holy place, the great temple, which was destroyed in the year 70 AD by the Roman armies. And Jesus, of course, during Holy Week, prophesies that destruction because of the sense of violence in the city at that time. But Jerusalem means so much more than just that city of Jerusalem. It means the divine and eternal concept of humanity's ability to make communities. But on this day we would have to say make temporary shelters. And it's that kind of aspect that we're thinking of. Probably the feast that had been enjoyed most by the younger Jesus would have been the feast of booths or tabernacles and as we leave the palms of Palm Sunday here and go on in our journey and remember this day is a stepping stone to our Holy Week but we have something special to share with you about not the feast of Passover but the feast of what we traditionally in the scriptures call tabernacles and autumn feast of fruitfulness. So let's go on and make our fourth stop and that stop is a citrus stop and when we get there you'll see something of that too. Willow, myrtle, palm and now citrus. At this time of year we've come into the greenhouse to find citrus and the shop may be a bit dark just to begin with um, but it will get lighter for you a bit later on. We've come into the warmth of the greenhouse to enjoy its shelter, not only for the trees, but for us, but also to think of a particular lesson which Jesus is very conscious of, that in the journeys that he and his family will have made to Jerusalem for the pilgrim feasts each year, probably one of the most enjoyable was the Feast of Tabernacles, it used traditionally to be called, and it could be called a feast of, of booths or shelters or tents or dwellings. The Greek word will take all those meetings, even homes. But uh, in Hebrew times, they had to make temporary homes as they went because it was going to be a long feast. And as I said before, in these shelters, the tabernacles, the tents, the booths that they made would be woven the, and still are wherever the Jewish uh, faith finds itself woven the leaves of palm and myrtle and willow and citrus. But all this is a sign of our journeying as human beings and our desire to make homes for ourselves. Now the deanery has been the home of many families 
And uh, one of the families, the Duval family, for Victor Duval, was here with his wife Esther and the, the whole family uh, in the years from uh, 1976 to about 1986. But we always think of the deanery families, like Wendy White Thompson I was mentioning before, as still part of the family of this wonderful dwelling. But any dwelling is something temporary. And Jesus is very firm about that with the woman of Samaria in St. John's Gospel. The time will come, he says, when neither on this mountain, talking about Mount Gerizim in Samaria, which was her holy place, or in Jerusalem will folk worship, but God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. All those things we shall come back to again and again in Holy Week, and particularly on Good Friday. But for this morning, there's a gift which Edmund has brought to the cathedral to share with us. It's an installation of a, a, a piece of sculpture in pottery and glass with gleams of gold in it, and it's called uh, the sukkah, which is the word for a shelter, one of the shelters made. Remember how on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let me make three shelters, booths, tabernacles, for one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, wanting to stay. But everything about Jesus' development of his vocation in body, mind and spirit, like us, is a story of development and realisation. Until one gets to the point, a little later on in Holy Week, when the hour has come at the Greeks' question, we'd like to see Jesus. And Jesus' ministry by that time has reached the concept that his arms will embrace the whole world when he's lifted up and the arms are outstretched. But that will be at the cost of his humanity in pain and still, shall we say, nervousness and anxiety. We've got the agony in the garden to go through and then we have the painful journey of the cross itself. All of that awaits us this week, but for the moment, let's glory in the fact that humanity can make homes and shelters and surround them with the leaves of creation represented by the willow and the myrtle and the palm and the citrus, all biblical plants. But as we've said, Different cultures, different parts of our world grow different things at different times and all are signs of our spiritual, mental and physical journey. Uh, I mentioned Edmund's mother, Esther, and she has always been a great teacher of the Benedictine way. Well, we know this, this cathedral church was a Benedictine monastery for a, a thousand years of its life and those strands run deep. The strands of valuing humanity in body, mind and spirit. A humanity living in community, given to hospitality. That's the essence of the rule of St. Benedict. But it's also the essence of community life the world over, at its best. And it's the essence of us, scattered right across the world in a garden congregation and beginning Holy Week together holding branches and twigs of different kinds because we're in different places and different leaves are there for us. But it's actually the same world that we are taking care of and the same human family in 2021 that we have responsibility for and also the same vocation that we have to journey on and find shelters. At the end this morning, we've attached a conversation that I had with Edmund in the St. Gabriel's Chapel, where the light shows through the 12th century glass onto Edmund's installation, the sukkah, which shows little pottery vessels, oh so fragile, perhaps representing our own hum humanity, and tall vessels of glass reflecting light and reaching up to heaven and gleams of gold and all day long the light is changing 
for our journey changes according to the light, the light we see. As our psalm was very clear, I have kept a lantern burning for my anointed, said the, the psalmist this morning. And this sukkah comes from a great exhibition which was held in uh, Venice, partly in the, in the uh, um, ghetto there in Venice, which was a sign of Jewish exile, but we could have traced that through the scriptures. But it's really a sign of the cruelty that has caused so many exiles to be journeying through history. And you can look around the world today, and we shall do in, in the days of Holy Week, and see so much suffering. If we look at Burma, Myanmar, with all that's going on today, and the suffering of that nation, and the world looking on in horror and trying to influence that situation as best they can. But we can look at one another also in the pandemic and see what we're having to wrestle with at this part of our journey. And each of us in our own lives will be developing our thinking, developing our physical creativity, developing our mental uh, understanding of where we are, where the world is, and how we've got to this point and what we envision for the future, and spiritually too, as we reach out to that which is infinite. And for us, beginning Holy Week together, the journey is led by the man on the donkey, the beast that no one's ever sat on before, going to meet his destiny in the holy city. And so, so many of these themes will come back to us. But for this morning, we've been helped to say our Hosanna by willow and myrtle and palm and citrus and the sense of the shelter which all creation enjoys and the warmth and hospitality given. Here's Tiger back to join us. So we're going to say our prayers this morning and uh, we're going to remember in our prayers on this Palm Sunday, first of all, the people of Burma, Myanmar, and uh, as the news unfolds on our screens, we think of their vulnerability, but vulnerable people the world over and in our Anglican Communion on this day, we are praying for the Anglican Communion Diocese of Hong Kong, Shen Kung Hui. We've so many friends there, and uh, we can't name them all, but certainly we uh, send out our love and best wishes to St. John's Cathedral there, and Dean Matthias, and Felix the organist, and all of those, and all our friends that live there, they know who they are. Uh, and uh, also to Bishop Paul Kwong, the bishop of that diocese, who's a great friend here and also a member of our own Cathedral Council. So we give thanks for that um, aspect of our communion life. And then we pray for Archbishop Justin, who will be joining us this afternoon for Holy Week, and for Bishop Rose and for Bishop Tim at Lambeth. And today we're praying for the Parish Church of All Saints at Biddenden and St. Michael at Smarden. And at the moment they're uh, without a, a parish priest, so we pray for those looking after them and also for those choosing a new parish priest for them. Bring your own intentions and, and concerns to the prayer here this morning. Here is the prayer for Holy Week. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross. Grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we say each in our own language the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of silence now on this Palm Sunday morning as we enter Holy Week.
Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen. Edmund, it's wonderful to welcome you to Canterbury again. Always a welcome visitor. Thank you. But we're here for a very special occasion. And we've this morning seen your installation of the Sukkah brought here into Canterbury Cathedral. Can you say a little bit about the installation to begin with? Yes. Uh, well, it, well, first of all, it's just, as you can imagine, incredibly moving and special for me to be back here in Canterbury and to be in this particular place. So this um, installation is, is called Sukkah. It, I made it originally for um, the Sukkah, for a, a special room high up above one of the synagogues, the oldest synagogue in the ghetto in Venice. Um, the Sukkah is a place where you uh, um, celebrate the festival of Sukkot, which is the festival of the tabernacles. Celebrating a very interesting festival, as you know. Yes. It celebrates wonderful things. It's a sort of harvest festival, really, for the Jewish faith, but it's also a reflection on, on a moment of sort of pause after the years of, of traveling. So it's, it's, it's got lots of interesting um, um, connections um, to, to things that matter to us. And, and I made this installation for that particular place, a very beautiful high up. And um, with your blessing, I brought it to St. Gabriel's Chapel in the cathedral. So in a way, the, 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 the situation it is enshrining and showing us is a look back into history and also a fact of the present for Jewish people as well. And the history is one of wandering and sheltering themselves in the wilderness and then keeping that memory going year by year at harvest time. Yes, it, it, what, it, what, it, what it does is to, is to talk about the vulnerability, yes. <laughs> for us all, of, yes. of, 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 of that where we are is only temporary, but that, that we are all really migratory. Yes. We're really in transit, you know, in our lives and in the spaces that we inhabit briefly. Um, and it's the briefness of that moment that is so kind of in special to that particular festival. And, and here, you know, this is very simple. Well, this is, this is porcelain vessels. I'm a potter. Yes. And it's, it's leaning pieces of gold, gilded aluminium. And these towers, these, these structures, so it's, it's really kind of making making real a representation of, of transients, of the temporary. And, and a sukkah would, would have been made, and still is made, of, of materials that were to hand, mm. quite fragile materials, and also would include symbols of fruitfulness and vegetation and, and things of that kind to remember, remind us of creation. Absolutely, and, and then the festival itself would be full of noise yes. and glory. And actually, one of the reasons <laughs> that we're here is that this, this particular place has got one of the most, oh, most enlivening um, um, bits of Romanesque sculpture anywhere in Europe um, of the animals playing, this, playing instruments. And it's, it's got that, that feeling of celebration and, and, of, and release as well. This is all around this beautiful decorated pillar mm -hmm. uh, and the instruments they're playing are so varied but all of them are making a loud noise and one's reminded of the psalmist who constantly is expressing joy by uh, mentioning instruments. I call the whole ins um, exhibition and installation in Venice in, in the ghetto psalm. Yes. And you know the psalms are what are really at the heart of <laughs> both of the great, all the Abrahamic traditions. Yes. Um, and, the, and, and the Psalms are extraordinary. You know, they are, well, we live them day by day, but, but they are, of course, the great song, songs of exile, yes. uh, of, uh, of remembering Jerusalem. But they're also, as you, know, as you suggest, full of, full of happiness and noise, as well as, as, as elegiac and, and, and sadness. So, so the Psalms 
you know, and this whole cathedral is, is built in the songs. Yes, <laughs> indeed, and, and the, rhythmically each day we say or sing them here. Yeah. And the psalms don't shy away from any human emotion. You have rage and sadness mm. and pain and joy and love and all kinds of, and wonder in a great measure. And because they're daily, they, it's one and then there's another. Yes. So you, it's, the par, it's the passing of, of one day into another and one emotion into another, which is so extraordinary. And, and, and part of this installation, part of what I'm trying to, to bring here is, of course, that everything, everything changes. It's about mutability. Yeah. So, you know, the, the shadows change. Um, these great windows bring light in and the, yes. and the sun comes and goes currently. Yeah. No sun, yeah. sun five minutes ago. Yes, yes. And, and so it's that sort of sense of, of sort of, in some ways, letting, letting one moment go and then another moment comes and that goes as well. And the Psalms do that. They manage to measure those days for us. Very much so. You were saying earlier that you've, you've known this place for 42 years or something of that kind and, and, and loved it. And when we walked around together, uh, a, a week or two ago, and uh, I, I was saying to you, where do you want this? I've, I felt you already had the idea in your head where you wanted it to be, but we did explore other places. Why here in the crypt, and why St. Gabriel? Well, for some, there was a very powerful pull for me from being high up in the ghetto, the highest place in the ghetto. Um, very extraordinary, poignant and painful place, right up, to being really down, almost below ground here, in, you know, in, in Canterbury. So it was that sort of, from the heights to the depths, um, which of course takes us into the sums. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, but, but, but this particular chapel, partly, I mean, it, it is, it is, 1976, it's, it's, it's 46 years I've yeah, been in this right. place. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's always meant a lot to me, this particular chapel, um, partly from childhood, from just the total joy <laughs> of the carvings. Yes. And then beginning to understand what some of these wall paintings might mean. And of course we have Anselm, I think it's Anselm here, uh, writing <laughs> yes. away yes. behind me. Um, so it's always had that kind of echo. And, and also, you know, I was a server here yes. um, as a child. And I remember, I, I was saying to you earlier, um, being here with Donald Coggan for yes. just, you know, in, in, you know yes. for, for early morning communion. So it, it's got a very powerful sense of me. And it's also, um, in brief, um, a very enclosed space. It is a sort of tabernacle. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a, a beautiful, enclosed, intimate space to bring this particular situation. Yes. This crypt has always been a sign of protection. Mm. Um, we have the Huguenot Chapel yeah. here, and, and they fled from violence mm -hmm. and were given temporary shelter, which mm -hmm. has continued mm -hmm. to this day with their French service on Sunday afternoons. But I remember when I came here first in 2001, mm -hmm. I came in July, and in September I witnessed the Archbishop saying prayers for so many Americans who had mm. poured into here after 9-11 mm. from cruise ships that had come in from Dover. Mm. And it felt as though we were giving shelter, emotional shelter, mm. to people who were completely shocked by this, this act of violence, so unexpected on an autumn morning in New York, mm. which had not known this before. So the crypt always speaks to me when I come in here as the praying heart of the cathedral. It, it really is. A holy place. I mean, there's no, you know, that's that's, that's yeah. the heart of this. Yes. But that that image of shelter is 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 a, is such a such a strong and powerful and enduring one. Which yes. It's just that um, shelters don't have to be grand. No. <laughs> to, to to have an impact, they don't have to. And, and actually, some of these particular chapels have very particular resonances in that in that way. We've watched as this was put together this mm. morning mm. and made into the complete mm. installation, we watch the light change mm. and there's been wonder at the reflections that were happening here. You were feeling that too, you were very busy putting it together but I know that we were feeling very much that this was wondrous as the light came through and also shone even on the, the, the top here and, and 
Now we've come to the middle of the afternoon and the light is quite different again. Uh, so this, this changing activity of, of creation is very present. It's, it's, there's a wonderful poem by Horace Thomas called The Bright Field. Yeah, indeed, I know it well. <laughs> yeah, I know also well, the, the, the pieces that you made for Rowan Williams. For, for, for Rowan yes, when yeah, he left, yeah. absolutely. And yes. it, is that, it is that feeling, you know, for yes. me, which is, you know, I, I, you know I, I've grown up in this place. Yes. And it is, it's absolutely The Bright Field. That, 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 um, the, the feeling that, that you, you look up, you just look up and something's changed. Yes. You know, and that's it. Yes. You know, that's the moment of yes. of of um, to not hold on to. Yes. <laughs> you know, just just but just to, just to acknowledge. And I suppose what I'm trying to do with my pots and my installations yes. is not make something kind of grand and enduring and blah yes. blah blah yeah. at all, but just simply briefly put something in someone's hands yes. or let the light change and and, and and catch it just briefly a yeah. different a different feeling. Yes. That's kind of enough. <laughs> in this in this tabernacle, mm. shall we call it, yeah. or mm. really a, a series of tabernacles. Mm. You can look at it in, mm. in, in two ways. All the busyness mm. is in the lower part, mm. and it's as though the tranquility begins as things go higher, and there's nothing to interrupt the light except reflections from below. Is that an intentional way of going forward? Um, I, I'll take it <laughs> very much. I mean, the, 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 sort of the architecture of it and the scale of yes. the volumes of it come, yes. come actually, out of, out, actually out of the Jewish ghetto, where, yes. where, they, where as you know, Jews yes. were not allowed to, 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 to expand from this tiny space. Yes. Um, and so built higher and higher and higher volumes. Yes. So this is, this is a kind of that kind of space. But actually, of course, um, what's so wonderful about, um, about an empty vitrine, about a space with all yes. this, these may or may not represent people or yes. volumes, but is, is the term is, is just simply, just briefly, what you're doing is you're pausing a bit of the world. Yes. You know, you're just letting it just be for a little bit, which the tabernacle does. And so, yes, down below, <laughs> but yes. lots and lots of air and volume and space above us. It's a time of year now as we come mm. into um, Passion Tide mm. in the Church's calendar and then into Holy Week and, and on to Easter, when there is always a, a coming together within a compass of time, generally not very far apart, of Passover um, and Easter and the days leading up to it. And I know it was your, your desire that this should be here then. Can you speak a little bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, I mean part of my family journey in general, my family has been, yeah. my father of course is half Jewish. And my Jewish grandmother, Elizabeth, is buried just yeah. 300 yards away yes. from us here. Um, um, you know, brought, up, brought up in a Jewish household in Vienna. I'm a refugee, like my father, um, to Kent in 1939. But a, a person who, who mixed her, her Jewish upbringing with huge Christian faith. Yes. Um, so, um, so this mixture, this, this, this a creative muddle of Jewish and Christian uh, a life, uh, which I've been writing about and trying to tease out in my, in my both books and also in what I make. Of course, it, it's, it's kind of extraordinary for me <laughs> to bring, as you say, this moment of approaching Passover <laughs> and, appro and appro approaching Easter together I I in an installation here. I didn't know I'm answering your question at all. No, you are, indeed. And, and um, I, I want to say that it's so very easy mm. for Christians to forget that the whole of the life of Jesus mm. was lived out within the, the, the rhythmic seasons mm. of the Jewish year to which he was utterly faithful. Yes. And that he called that mm. sacred tabernacle on Mount Zion, mm. my father's house, mm. and couldn't understand why his parents were puzzled that they, they lost him and he mm. was there. But that kind of wonder when people say, well, there's not much teaching of Jesus about creation, there's all the teaching in the world about it, because the Psalms were his hymn book and life, they were ingrained on him. Yeah. And at the same time, his human body becomes that tabernacle of shelter, yes. fragile yes. and vulnerable. Yes. And, and, for, and, 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 and both these great festivals of, of Easter and yes. Passover yes. have, have the meal at the heart of it, you know, yeah. have, have yeah. this extraordinary 
powerful sense of a, a meal at the heart of them, um, and of course. And, and so, you know, it, it seems to me that this, it, well, honestly, it's like, it was such a hope for me that this might actually happen yes. at this particular moment. Yes, and now we shall be ourselves, mm. not only enjoying, but finding this place changed, as always happens when an installation mm. Uh, of imagination and creativity is placed in a, a, another significant space and they interact. So we are the ones who are going to be benefiting and, and learning on a journey day by day. And our, um, our, our gift to you is our gratitude for bringing this here to help our thinking and, and going forward in, in our Holy Week and at Passover time. Well, well, I mean, the, the, I, I, the, the gratitude is, is, is so total for me to be allowed to come back into these spaces I know and love and to, to work with you um, and, and, have, and be able to bring this back to, to, to this community line-up. So oh, it's just wonderful. It's a wonderful gift. Thank, thank you, Edmund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.